in, in Belgium and China, we moved to the, U, to the U.S. now with a, with a new uh, paper, Soluble Effect as a Transient Sports Confusion Symptom, the first case report by Dr. Cantor from Pontepeta. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. I'm very excited in an oral session to be discussing the case report, and I'm very glad that we're able to do that because we're going to talk about a unique case that happens all the time but isn't reported or is underreported. We're going to talk about pseudobulbar affect as a transient concussion symptom. The objective is to describe a case of transient pseudobulbar affect as a transient symptom of a sports concussion. The first problem is about definitions. The definition both of concussion and then we'll get into pseudobulbar affect. In terms of concussion, there is no uniform accepted definition of sports-related concussion, which is very amazing to a lot of people. There's a lack of uniform definition creates significant problems when you're trying to do research as well as when you're trying to code from an epidemiological point of view. Mild traumatic brain injury is often used to replace sports concussion, but as we'll see, there may be problems with this. And the consensus statement from Zurich 2008, so we had first Vienna, then Prague, and that Zurich 2008 published in 2009, and this year, uh, towards November, there will be Zurich 2012. So concussion is complex. The American Academy of Neurology has a definition a trauma-induced alteration in mental status that may or not involve a loss of consciousness. This is important, and this is why this year the guidelines will be moving away from the idea of having graded and having different types of concussion. Most concussions do not involve loss of consciousness. In Zurich 2008, it just states a complex pathophysiological process affecting the brain induced by traumatic biomechanical forces. As you can see, very general, they could not come to a consensus. The American Academy of Neurology has a sports neurology section of which I'm a member, and we try to take a little bit further approach to try to define concussion as a transient brain injury. Pseudobulbar affect. Pseudobulbar affect I see as a discoordination of affect and emotion. Emotion is what you feel, affect is how you display it. And I think that sometimes it does not get coordinated well. Similar to when we're doing a cerebellar exam for motor dysfunction, a person may have a cerebellar stroke, and they may be strong, but they may have impaired cerebellar check, they may have cerebellar hypotonia. Other terms have been used in the past. On the one side and the left side, you'll see ones that take into account affect better, such as IEED. And then on the right side, you'll see some terms that are unfortunate because they are such terms as emotional ability. Pseudobulbar affect does not mean that your emotion is labile, but that your affect is labile. This is not synonymous with pseudobulbar palsy. We recently presented two weeks ago at the Consortium of MS Centers that PBA is not uncommon. We're looking at data from a trial in the United States, but this is a review of the literature. And when you look at traumatic brain injury, you can see how depending on your criteria and depending on the trial, there can be different levels of pseudobulbar affect. Transient pseudobulbar affect as a result of sports concussion has not previously been described. So in this case, we have a 29-year-old previously healthy American arena football player. So back to definitions. Arena football. So this is American football, but it's played not outside, not even in an area where there's out of bounds. As you can see, there actually is this area where there's going to be where there's going to be a wall. And this patient fell over the wall at the end, and he was so over here on the side, you can see how there's no out of bounds. He fell over 1.25 meters, he hit the back of his head, and he had a concussion. Although, he continued playing as nobody saw it happen, although this is televised on local stations. After the game, the athletic trainer, and the athletic trainer is like the first person who's going to see people. It's almost like an ambulance driver for the rest of healthcare. 
they saw him, and they saw him holding his head in his hands, crying. Despite the victory, he didn't feel sad, but he was crying. In addition, he had dull occipital headaches with phonophobia, with photo, with phonophobia without other associated migraine features. But due to his embarrassment over the crying, he did not celebrate the victory, which is probably good because he didn't go out and drink alcohol that night. But he also did not return home to his girlfriend. As you can imagine, this highlights how pseudobarbar affect can be socially disabling. The symptoms were transient. Within 24 hours, the pseudobarbar affect resolved. His headaches improved over five days. Both of these, of course, without treatment. We generally do not treat patients with concussion from sports because one of the definitions of returning to play is that they are no longer having symptoms off of all medications. So he had a normal neurologic examination, computerized, which is often being used in the United States, and formal neuropsychological testing were both normal. Impact test is being used a lot of times in the United States. The FDA panel has said this is not a replacement of clinical judgment. But um, the cognitive efficiency measuring both speed and accuracy improved from his baseline. And this we often see because he was probably related to his effort. When he took the baseline exam, he wasn't really trying. Now after the concussion, he wants to return to play. In fact, we just did a news story in the United States where a girl in soccer had four concussions, and she said that what they do is they score low at the beginning of the season so that every time they have a concussion, they don't look as stupid as they, as they could look. There was no recurrence of the pseudobarbar affect or his headaches. So how can we generalize this? A case is only useful when you can find generalizations. So concussion is a form of traumatic brain injury. Whether we want to call it mild or not, sometimes it's not mild. Soldiers returning from combat zone may be left with a more permanent form of pseudobarbar affect from traumatic brain injury. And this can contribute, much like with our patient, to social isolation. It can increase direct and indirect health costs. Pseudobarbar affect screening is useful, but it depends on what kind of screening you use. There is the Center for Neurologic Studies Lability Scale. This is actually patient scored. They just answer seven questions, and we'll get to it. And then there also is PLAQS, which is Pathological Laughing and Crying Scale. And this is interviewer rate. So CNS-LS is available. There's seven questions. It's almost like a cheat scale, similar to Glasgow Coma Scale, where one means never. So automatically, everybody has a seven. And all you need is 13 or higher to be suggestive of pseudobarbar affect. So some of these questions are about crying easily. And you have to look at depression also as a possibility. That's the main differential diagnosis. The simple way I ask patients is, do you ever think that people think that you look angry or sad or happy, but you don't feel that way inside. So your affect is different than your mood. How do we understand, understand pseudobarbar affect? So pseudobarbar affect, they used to understand that there was an idea of voluntary tracts, corticobulbar tracts, and involuntary tracts for crying and laughing. And then there was a center in the brainstem that had to do with laughing and crying center. That's changed, and we think more about neural networks. And we think about this idea that all the way from the frontal lobe down to the cerebellar connections with some emotional input from the limbic system, in a normal person, you know how to take all the sensation and to integrate it. You feel something, and then you express it. However, with somebody with pathological laughing and crying, or PBA, what you will often see is if you notice the difference here has to do with the dotted line. You're not able to take in everything that's happening, both from the outside as well as what they're feeling on the inside. And it becomes this dysregulation from a cerebellar point of view. In conclusion, concussion is a form of traumatic brain injury. This is important. This is important from the point of view of legislation. In the United States, we're pushing for legislation to protect our youth. And in Florida, we have been successful this past year. Pseudobulbar affect is under-recognized symptom of traumatic brain injury and other neurological disorders. PBA may occur transiently in sports concussions. 
And this is different than when somebody says, well, I was crying because I was sad. Support and reassurance of the athlete is important because this patient felt socially isolated because of what was going on. So you want to have education regarding the proposed neuroanatomy, even if we simplify it for the patients. And we want to reduce the social isolation that goes on. We also talk about cognitive rest, and this is part of the Zurich 2008 consensus for return to play. There is a need for further research, both in terms of the pathophysiology and the putative neuroanatomy, as well as functional imaging to get a better idea of where PBA is coming from. With that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. That's insights from Kiss Hacker Kiss report. So are there questions or comments? Uh, two questions. I mean you report a transient cerebral bar effect, which probably is quite difficult to retrospectively recognize, I believe. Uh, what about more permanent ones? Uh, is, is that frequent of the sports confusion or not? So, pseudo bubble affect in general, yeah. we know that it exists in underlying neurological diagnoses. We don't know fully the epidemiology, and that's why there is a registry right now. It's a point prevalence epidemiological study in the United States called PRISM, looking at six diagnoses, MS, ALS, stroke, mm -hmm. dementia, and Parkinson's, and TBI, traumatic brain injury. So there, there we usually think about the TBI we see returning from war zone. But in terms of sports, you know, there's not good epidemiology in general. We're trying to get better databases about what's going on in terms of concussions in general. We know that there's about 1.8 to almost 3 million concussions in the United States uh, every year. And I was looking for the European data. And if anybody has the European data, I'll be very... Uh, Grateful for that. Okay, and my, my second comment relates to, to the name Sir Bilber. Yes. Uh, to some extent, it's misleading. I believe. Very much so. Because it might not be as pseudo as we think, yeah. but pseudobulbar affect came from various historical reasons. One is pseudobulbar palsy, where the person well, looks like they have a lower motor neuron problem with their cranial nerves, with their lower cranial nerves from the medulla, from the bulb was associated also with pseudobulbar affect. So the people who had pseudobulbar palsy also had pseudobulbar affect. But then we've extended it. And that's why that term, it's very unfortunate that we've moved from IEED, which a couple of years ago was how we were supposed to call it. This is related to the FDA and their label for a medication that was approved and it's being studied right now by the EMA uh, is being considered the FDA made the label say pseudobulbar affect. So it looks like for now, once there's medications using the term, I think it will continue in the literature. Other questions? Everyone is convinced? Very good. Great. Thank, Thank you. you.